G'day and a welcome to uh, a little bit of a live stream we're doing here at uh, the Oak Barrel to try some new releases to have a little bit of fun. My name is Scott Fitzsimons and I look after all the whiskey and spirits here at the Oak Barrel. Now, we are in a little bit of a lockdown period at the moment. Uh, well, we're not calling it a lockdown, we call it a stay at home period. So um, we normally would, uh, when we have a new releases come through the store, would uh, crack them open, share them with a bunch of people coming through. But because we're at stay at home orders at the moment, we're a little bit lonely here. There's not as many people coming through as we would normally like and expect. So uh, instead of doing that, uh, we're going to create some little videos to put on the website and in various places. Um, but to actually go through the process of recording all the videos, cutting them up, uploading them to YouTube. That sounded like a lot of work to me, so I figured may as well just do a live video. We'll have a bit of a chat about these whiskies, uh, and then I don't have to cut anything down. It's very basically the uh, the lazy way to do things. So uh, the whiskies that we've uh, got through today, and I want to say a big thank you to Simon um, from uh, Select Scotch who, who brought these in, is a new release from the Can't More series. Now, this is part of the, the Morrison's range of whiskies, um, uh, one of their brands that they produce. It is – Carnmore for me has always been this bit of an elusive indie bottler. I've, I've managed to pick up bottles here and there throughout my time, mainly before I started at the Oak Barrel, um, but then there wasn't a huge amount available in Australia. So it's great to actually see them in, in the country, and uh, albeit in very limited quantities, um, but we have a lot of fun with them as, as we go. So um, there's a few things I want to go through. Today. There's actually six whiskies that uh, I, I want to try. Um, and I'm trying these for the first time. So um, your my reaction is going to be the very honest and, and first one. So we're going to have a bit of fun. Um, but going through each whiskey. So I think the first one we're going to try, and I'll bring it up on the on the big screen here, is uh, Pulteney. So um, Pulteney in Wick um, is home to the brand Old Pulteney. Uh, you'll see on the, the bottling there, it doesn't actually say Old Pulteney. It says Pulteney because that's the name of the distillery. Uh, Old Pulteney is the brand that they produce at that distillery. And um, oh, haven't, someone's done this up very, very tight. Um, but these are all these whiskies we're going to try, part of what we call the Strictly Limited series. So this is a series that is not necessarily single cask. Everything's at 47.5%. Um, but there are... You know, there are single cask examples of it, uh, and, and there's often casks that are put put together um, in the same thing. So why I'm trying with this, and again, I haven't tried any of these, so I'm hoping I'm going to get the order reasonably right based on just, just the specs. Um, but Pulteney is a distillery that I quite love. It's in, in a famous uh, fishing town called Wick on the east coast of Scotland, up in the north there. Um, but you very, very rarely see it as a as a single mould. It's, it's something that is kept quite close to the chest. We were lucky enough to see a single cask um, official bottling uh, come through Australia recently. But in terms of in, in the hands of independence, it's, it's quite a rare release. Um, so quite excited to, to start with this. And also something that I think might be um, you know, on, on the lighter side of things. There, there are tasting notes uh, for each of each of these whiskies that they, that they have put uh, on. They put a little bit on, on the back of the bottles and we might read them after we've had a, a go with actually – uh, our own uh, uh, tasty notes and see what, see what we reckon, and then we can have some fun after that. But diving straight in, 47.5. This is a uh, it's a, a 2011 vintage uh, matured in bourbon barrels. Now, there's something I've noticed, and I don't know if this is true or not, but on some of the releases, and you can see it if I bring this cask back up again, it says bourbon barrels there. Now, that might be an indicator of a single cask versus a marriage of casks, but we're, we're saying bourbon barrels here. I'm assuming plural. This is going to be a small batch, probably have added from a few casks here. Uh, nine years old, it was bottled this year, so it's a, it's a nine-year-old. 678 bottles in the run. So if it has come from uh, more than one bourbon cask, it's, it's certainly either been, been skimmed or, or come from no more than, than two or three. But the nose is, is it's very potney, funnily enough. It's very light and delicate there's a bit of bit of that honey sort of note there i don't know whether this is me going looking for it or, or whether it's there but I'm, I'm definitely getting a bit of a, a salty briny sort of edge really really soft um very typical of what you know you say the uh, the old pontley 12 maybe uh gets up but this is at 47.5 however so maybe it's a little bit more prominent because of that extra abv 
very alluring, very, very, very pleasant. It's I, I think um, I don't obviously haven't tried the other ones yet, but this is probably a good place to start based on uh, based on these initial thoughts. Yeah, light, light honey. It's it's a little bit grassy, but it's definitely that that salinity and that coastal sea air sort of thing coming through there on the nose. Hmm. A palate, palate's quite interesting. It's got a bit of almost uh, dankness or dampness to it, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, uh, a quick uh, shout out to whiskey is my jam. Comments there, six hundred and seventy eight bottles in the poultry, so more than more than one cask, one hundred percent. Could it could have been two? Could have been three? Also, could have been skimmed from from a few casks. We're not one hundred percent sure on that, but really nice. Thanks, uh, sort of pal. It, it's not miles away from the the veritable twelve year old. No, I do really love that that whiskey. It's, it's regardless of price or age, it's one of my favourites out of the poultry range. It just feels like it's amped up a little bit. It's got a little bit more oomph to it. 47.5 bit of bit of lanolin on the on the palate it's not a i wouldn't say it's ne like necessarily overly oil but it's certainly not dry either it sort of sits in the middle there uh the, the finish is a is a good length probably like you know you say medium whatever that means um but very very pleasant uh sort of whiskey i might dump into uh to their tasting notes um fragrant with honeysuckle on the nose and a fresh north sea salty notes on the palate uh is their sort of quick overview and i i you definitely see that um you know it, it was it is quite a quite an aromatic fragrant sort of nose but um something very very enjoyable and uh such a rare treat to try pulpney now um it does does say bourbon barrels looking at the color of you probably can't see it as well in my glass you can see it probably better in the bottle that uh, is is up on screen now. That's it's quite a light color, so I'm going to assume some sort of uh, refill barrel, because right? you do this is this is a very spirit dominant dram. I can feel just on that finish there. It, it's a good length. It's it's sort of medium length, um, but it's got that that bit of oomph, that bit of ruggedness uh, to say that the spirit's still very evident in in this, which I, I quite like. Um, but certainly not based on you know the colors and the specs of a few that we're going to come up and see in a second. Um, certainly not as cast driven as as some of those. Yeah, so we might uh, now move on to uh, the second whiskey I want to try tonight. Um, and the links for, for all these details, if you don't catch it, they all should be on the on the video description there with the links so you can see the, the pictures and, and content as you uh, want to go across it. Reach up for another glass here. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is a Manicmore um, distillery that I – really love but it, it's a distillery uh, a workhorse part of diageo's uh, uh family of distilleries goes into all sorts of blends it's a relatively new distillery by their um, or by scotch whiskey standards uh you know that often can be that sort of drier floral cereally sort of note off of manic moors so they do get quite nutty and and complex after a bit of time um into the hands of certain independent bottlers but it's a distillery i love because it i very rarely try it outside of independent bottlers and therefore it's really up to the discretion of them what they want to do um we can see on this one reading the the uh, bottle it's a darker color uh, straight away um all these images were taken with the same lighting so they should be pretty honest transparent uh versions of the lighting uh 2009 bottled in 2021 it's an 11 year old uh, 721, and again, we see the phrase first field hogsheads. Uh, when I say again, I mean that that plural. So of, obviously more than one hogs hogshead, but uh, uh, first field bourbon casks in, in this case, and that's where that colour is coming through. Oh, and this is this is uh, big on the nose. That bourbon cask has had quite a bit to say here. This, there's a lot more cask influence here, but it's like a peanut oil or, or pecan nut. Sort of thing, which is really alluring. I think mean, Manicmore's a funny distillery. I, I, I've never met anyone that you go, you know, what, name your top three distilleries, and Manicmore appears there. Or you say, hey, what's the best whiskey you've tried in the past five years? Like, oh, this Manicmore. But it's just always so consistent that you can be pretty sure that whatever you're going to do, um, or whatever you're going to get out of a bottle, is is going to be pretty good. And I think it's that appeals to blenders. Obviously, it's very highly 
priced as a blender's malt, but also appeals to independent bottlers because you can play with it. You can have a bit of fun knowing that it's going to stand up to whatever treatment you sort of play it through. So um, big nuttiness and pecan. I, I love that that peanut oil. Now, I'd say if it was macadamia nuts, it's not macadamia nuts. Definitely getting that that peanut oil. In a bit of uh, a yeah, bit more sweetness, a bit of creme brulee or, or, you know, some sort of salt, uh, not salted, but like some caramels or something there. I'm using a different glass, so there's definitely a um, salt residue coming in from the old Pulteney. Again, we're at 47.5, uh, part of the strictly limited range, so uh, uh, consistently at 47.5. Very, very pleasant. I like lovely soft texture. There's a bit of like stone fruit, uh, maybe a bit of like peach uh, on, on the palate there, but that's actually just a really enjoyable experience, very soft, uh, approachable whiskey, uh, not, like completely inoffensive, and pretty much exactly what I expect from from good Manic Mall. Um, you know, we're 11 years old. We're, we're not a, a young whiskey anymore. And, and in first field cast, they've, they've certainly had their say, but quite a rich. And, yeah, I, I mean, this is uh, this is very Moorish. I'm going to uh, jump on to the writing on the back of the bottle here to see what they have to say about themselves. Um, toffee and orange candy with a gentle hint of cinnamon is the official overview. Um, so I, did, I didn't get as much uh, cinnamon spice on this as, as maybe uh, they do, but and, and honestly, not, not as not as much orange. But you know, everyone's different, so you know, you, you might get more orange than than I do. But this for me is is all for nutty decadence. It's sort of a late night. Uh, it, it's not quite pour over your ice cream sort of dram. It's it's not sweet enough, but um, certainly if you if you like your desserts a little bit more savoury, I can definitely see the appeal here. And again, you know. Maybe I'm going to be that person that starts to put Manic Moore in their top five distilleries of all time because I very, very rarely had one that disappoints. Um, and, and particularly when you take off the, the shackles of the blenders and you get to strengths like 47.5 and there's been a lot of single cast at natural cast strength, particularly with some of the younger stuff that gets up to, to 60% and, and above, um, they're really special special whiskies. So, um, yeah, a bit, bit of a sleeper hit there, something, uh, something quite, quite good that uh, I would very happily go back and, and drink again. Uh, in terms of our allocations for these whiskies, they're they're anywhere between about two and two and six bottles. So there's not a lot around. Um, by the time you're looking at this, it might already be sold out. But um, that's all right. The art of loving whiskey is the art of letting things go sometimes and moving on to the next one. And then, and lucky thing is, there's always going to be another manic mall to to have a bit of fun with. All righty, let's grab another glass and move along. Into another whiskey. Now, what do you reckon we go to now? So coming up, we've got a Glen Keith, a Glen Bergie, a Ben Riak, and a Kalila. But I think let's play with Glen Bergie because uh, this could be – this is probably a good side-by-side -side to do with the Manic Moor. Um, it's much younger. Uh, this is a 2013 into um, a presumably ex-bourbon, then Saturn's wine cask for the finish. Um 607 bottlings, bottles, so uh, probably not a single cast. Could could potentially be, but I'd, I'd say probably not. Um, but, yes, yeah, se seven years old with a turns cask finish in it. So, yeah, um, whiskey is my jam. Uh, makes a, a good point on the on the chat here, and this is a good thing about it. If I was just sitting here recording these videos for the website by myself, uh, it'd be very boring and lonely, and uh, it's been very boring and lonely the last couple of days with uh, don't call it a lockdown stay-at-home orders here in Sydney. Um, but he mentions the Carnmore used to be 46%, um, but the last couple of recent batches have gone up to 47.5. And, yes, you can see uh, by the image there, that's actually the, the newer design of, of the Carnmore releases. They did have strictly limited um, under their old style labels as well, um, and they, they do do a single cast series as well that is, that is natural cast strength. But, yes, the um, – Stri strictly Limited has jumped up to 47.5, which is great. Now, Glenbergie is, is, a, is a story that quite fascinates me. Uh, I uh, had to actually go back and look to how many Glenbergies we've had during my uh, past six years here at the Oak Barrel, and there's been a couple, but not a huge amount. Uh, there's been a few through uh, Signatory. I think we had one from Caddenheads about four or five years ago. But you hear about all the time these whiskies, these blenders malts that are highly prized by the, the blending 
companies and the blenders and, and they sort of hold on to them. It's very true of, of Linkwood and Manicmore and all these sorts of things, but there's physically enough for it to go around for indie bottlers to get their hands on as well. Uh, not so true with, with Glen Berge. Pretty much everything that they produce is, is uh, reserved for blends and particularly Ballantines. Uh, and in fact, the very few single malt releases of Glen Berge that are official actually appear under the Ballantines label. It's such a key part of that um, that that blend. It still is about two hundred years old, but um, I just that certainly not a lot of people have have tried. Um, so I, I don't honestly really have. I've I've had a few, you know, maybe five, ten Glen Berges you know, in the past ten years, but I haven't really had enough as I've had with a Manic Moor or a Linkwood to really form a clear idea of that that spirit and that style. So, and this is going to be quite interesting. And, and from a passing knowledge of Saturn's casks, um, I'm expecting honey on the nose because that, that can really be a, a driver in this now. Um, it's obviously a finish. We, we don't know how long the finish is. But, yeah, um, may have talked myself into it there, but certainly a, a big lashing of honey on the nose. But it's, you know, like a, like a, like fresh honey straight out of the hive. Yeah, and, and but like when I say that it's it's fresh in its in its aromatics, it's not dominating. There's a bit of grassiness there as well. Bit of grassiness, touch of touch of oak or, or sort of like a cereally, not sawdusty, but like a crushed crushed grain sort of thing, like cereal, like malt husk sort of notes on it, which probably shows is you know shows its its relative youth there, but big sort of honey uh, on on the palate as well, which is. Is is very interesting. I, I dare say this is not going to affirm my thoughts about Glenbergie one way or the other in terms of uh, putting it into a box and categorising it because it doesn't really taste like Glenbergies I've had before. But that's that's the beauty of uh, of cast finishes. Bit of bit of spice on the palate. Tapers off a, a little bit. Um, the finish is quite malty. A little, a little bit of that cut grass thing coming back, but quite quite a malty finish. That cask influence, that honey is very front forward, I think, for, for me. Um, but like a, a raw cracked pepper sort of a spice in, in the mid palate there. Very, very interesting. Um, it's got those same hallmarks, though, uh, and you probably – I don't know how good the definition is on this, this video, but you can see these beautiful legs sticking to it, really viscous uh, sort of whiskey. Uh, the legs really sticking to the side of the glass, and – I'm really enjoying that texture. Uh, it's sort of what brings me to some of these workhorse distilleries and and the and the blenders malts is the, the way that they're they're built and the texture they they carry that binds flavors together. And when you isolate those flavors, they can be these really sometimes raw but really uh, re really beautiful and textural sort of, sort of whiskies. So um, I'll see if we can jump into their official notes because uh, I'm, I'm I'm probably I probably got a little bit more off the manic more. The Glenburg is a little bit. Um, this is who I am. This is what I am straight away. I'm rushing through these, and obviously this is the first time I've tried them. They're probably, well, not probably, they almost certainly will evolve over time, but that big honey, bit of pepper um, into that grassy maltiness on, on the end. So we'll see what their overview of this particular release is. Uh, honeycomb, uh, honeycomb, apricot jam, and lusciously waxy mouthfeel. Yep. I get that. Uh, definitely that texture on, on the on the, on the the palate is a big winner for me. Um Probably not as much going on as, as the Pulteney or, or the Manicmore, but um, a whiskey I could spend a lot of time with. And certainly a whiskey that um, ticks the boxes for me. Texture is such a huge part of how I appreciate whiskey and, and what makes me fall in love with certain whiskies that I can I can definitely see my um, my interest for, for Glen Berge has been piqued uh, by this release if that itch hasn't necessarily been completely scratched, which is, uh, is often a good side because I reckon the next Glen Berge I come across – I'm, I'm going to jump on as well, but this is really, really fascinating little whiskey, um, and very, very classic, uh, you know, workhorse blenders. Despite the fact that of that Saturn's cask finish, which has given it that big honey sort of uh, driving uh, plushness on on the nose, uh, I, I dare say before that cask finish, this would have been a, a reasonably one-dimensional sort of malt i can see that it was just sort of sitting there you know another 10 years it probably revolved into something very very special but um i, I can see why this was a candidate for, for the cast finish there um it, it's given another couple of dimensions all righty so 
So far, so good in terms of uh, picking the the order. Uh, to be fair, those three probably could have gone in any order, so I probably couldn't get it wrong there. But the um, the fourth whiskey we're going to look at is um, a, a favourite distillery of mine and, and probably of yours, considering how many people I know uh, really rave about this uh, distillery. And we're going to Glen Keith now. Um, not delving too far away from the specs of uh, that Glen Berge and the fact it's another 2013 vintage. It's a seven-year-old. Um, this was bottled this year. Uh, 672 in a virgin oak finish. Now, on specs, this is quite an interesting whiskey because Glen Keith um, is is grassy and and vibrant and and sort of very fresh when it's young. But then when you get past about you know 10, 12 years and you get into that those older expressions, this beautiful tropical fruit, uh, really, really uh, luxurious, old school. The, the type of you know bright tropical fruits that you don't get in in modern whiskies, but you know, if you're ever lucky enough to try whiskies from the 60s and 70s, was very, very prominent. So it's a real treat. Now, uh, the the thing that interests me coming off this, just on specs, um, and again, yeah, haven't haven't tried any of these uh, before before now, is the virgin oak finish. So you know, the virgin oak often gives you know a spice and and sometimes a hint of smokiness, but that real wood spice and and uh, sometimes marshmallowy sort of notes. Um, why, why, why did this Glen Keith need it? Why would you put that through that treatment? So I find this quite – this is probably the most intriguing on, on paper for me. Um, we'll see how it goes and see where that, that famous tropical fruit shows through. And on the nose, yeah, if, if it's not, you know, potentially as, as, uh, as luscious as in certain 20-odd releases, there is a lot of fruit. I don't know, where, where, where peaches, where – Bit a bit of like um, you know grapes, but when they're in the whole bunch, like green green table grapes in the whole bunch. Yep. Uh, shout out to Select Scotch who who is responsible for these samples tonight. So ten and two in in some of those virgin oak finishes. So we'll see if it gets there. But the um, it's a beautiful beautiful nose. It's it's very Glen Keith and it's very alluring. Um, if the if the Manic Moor was very Moorish, and the uh, and the the Pulteney had a bit of uh, this is uh, this is who I am this this is where I am this is this is trying to drag me in. I know at forty seven point five you don't need to sneak your schnoz all the way into a glass, but I want to. I want to with this. I want to get as close to it as possible. It's still it's like it's it's still showing its youth. There's a bit of malt in there. It's not I think, but it's actually the, the more it sits in the glass, there's a lot more florals as well coming through with that tropical fruit. And you know, sort of like petals that have just been plucked. You know, not not sort of dried dried, uh, you know, flower petals, but like freshly plucked flower petals. But a very very alluring nose. Probably probably the the uh, probably the prettiest of the of them all so far. Palette palette's a little bit drier. There's there's a bit more oak. On it, which is, I presume, we were going to get it at some point. It's a virgin oak finish. You'd be surprised if it, if it didn't get there. But it, it's certainly not overpowering. It's certainly not, um, you know, super tannic or, 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 you know, fence post or anything like that. And there's no sawdust element here. It's actually just giving it another dimension towards the end. And I think in the same way that the Saturn's cast gave a bit of a dimension to the Glen Berge at the front, this is giving it to the Glen Keith at, at the back at the finish. Um, yeah, it, I mean, I, I was worried that this wouldn't taste like the Glen Keith that I know and love. I was worried this was going to be a little bit left of centre and and something that needed to be fixed. But this is certainly a Glen Keith. This is, uh, it's it's just a, a variation. It, it's a teenager, uh, it, even though it's seven years old in whiskey terms. I say this is a this is a teenage Glen Keith with with a little bit to say and a little bit of a little bit of spunk and attitude. But still, with those core principles there. Now we'll uh, we'll, we'll dive into. Uh, the bottle itself and see what their overview quick description is uh, on the back of the label there. Uh, salted caramel and juicy tropical fruits leave a mouth-watering finish. And, yeah, we, we, we're on the same path. We're, we're doing it in different orders, but certainly getting those same elements there. Salted caramels and juicy. I don't get a huge amount of saltiness on it, but I do get that sort of um, 
hard caramel, like toffee caramel sort of aroma uh, to it, that little bit of confectionery sort of element. Very enjoyable. That. I, mean, I think it's one, and I've had a few people ask me, so like uh, the Glen Keith, have you tried it yet? No, no, I haven't. Sort of Glen Keith diehards. And I think this, this is a bit of a bridging dram uh, for, for Glen Keith. It's going to please the people who are Glen Keith um, diehards. You know, it's going to scratch that itch without paying $700 for 20-year-old Glen Keith. Um, but it's got the elements to sort of introduce people who haven't maybe tried this distillery before to come in and, and have a bit of a go at it. So I think it's quite an interesting one. Um, I, I would be would have been interested to, to see what it was like before it went into the virgin oak uh, finish, maybe just a little bit flat. Um, I wouldn't describe this whiskey as flat. I can see it's got a little bit of jump and a little of, you know, dy dynamism uh, to it. So I, I dare say that's, that's probably what it was. But, um, but yeah, very... Uh, very interesting release in Ikea. I think it's it's it will help people get into Glen Keith, but also um, appease the, the Glen Keith drinkers. But um, certainly, certainly very, very, very pleasant. And, and um, you know, I don't like talking about price, but if you're reading this on the website, um, when it's embedded underneath the uh, article, you'll, you'll see exactly what it's worth. And I think it's very good bang for buck. All righty, so... The, the the final two whiskies we're going to go through, I sort of did on colour. One of them's a Kalila, so that's obviously going to go last. Um, but there is a, a Ben Riek in um, – that's got quite a distinct colour. So I thought we'd do that after the the couple of bourbon cask uh, mature, maturations and finishes. So grab another glass very quickly and go into uh, an, another 2013. So this is the, uh, the trio of 13s. Uh, ben Riek, seven-year-old, um, 652 bottles in an Oloroso sherry butt. Now, I was making the point with uh, some of the early releases, particularly the Pulteney and the Manicmore, that we we don't know the, – the strictly limited range is, is great because it doesn't abide by too many rules. Everything's 47.5, but it doesn't have to be a single cask. It doesn't have to be a vatting. It can be whatever it wants. Um, on those bottlings, we saw bourbon barrels – and, and hogs heads, we saw the plural. Uh, this one says Oloroso Sherry Butt. So it, it's saying singular. So I'm going to assume that, you know, with 652 bottles at seven years old, so it's not that old, at 47.5, so it's stretched out a little bit. This could well be a single cask uh, of, from, from Ben Rick. I, I don't know that for sure, but, you know, this is just me reading into to the labels a little bit here. Um we are uh, big fans of Ben Riak here at the Oak Barrel. Um, we, we've bottled Ben Riak um, as, as exclusives for us. We've, we've enjoyed many of them. And what we love about it is that it can be anything that it, that it wants to be. It's a distillery that's been through so much in its history that in the modern time, it has a lot of whiskey maturing, but it doesn't necessarily have a house style it needs to stick to. It's not a um, strictly ex-bourbon distillery. It's not a strictly ex-sherry or fortified. It's not – they do peated runs, they do rum casts, they do all sorts of different barrels. Um, and, so, and so this is uh, uh, Oloroso Sherry Butt. We, we can see the colour, and again, all these photos were taken with the exact same light level to give you a pretty clear indication in real terms of what they, they look like. Mm, the nose is a little bit dirty, which um, – for someone who's not always the biggest fan of the the clean sherry cast, so I'm quite attracted to. There's a bit of a bit, bit of grit to it. There's still heaps of sweet, sweet fruit and almost like fruit juice on the nose, like really like blackberry juice or, or prune juice or something like that. There's a really rich aromatic, you know, fruit to it. It's it's not. I wouldn't say it's, it's a classic, you know, when you when you talk about Oloroso sherry cast, you talk about fruitcake, raisins, you know, dark chocolate, that that sort of stuff. Um, there's not a huge amount of those. Of, they're, they're all there, but it's not, they're not the dominant factors. I think there's a real juicy element to this. Very, very luscious uh, sort of whiskey. Carries through. On, onto the palate, there's a bit of almost hospital, uh, not hospital, a uh, forest floor sort of sort of dampness. That sort of um, you know when you when you're walking through 
you know, sort of like rainforests and, and that sort of stuff, and you get that sort of not not petrichor, but that that dampness of the the foliage on the ground. I can see certain elements of that in here, and I think it's it's a very it's a very Ben Reak release in the fact that Ben Reak take quite wide heart cuts. You know, we, we say Ben Reak it has a big heart. Uh, it loves everyone, uh, and you can see those elements in here. It's this is not a precise whiskey. It's a it's a full uh, not full, but like it's it, and it's not bloated, but it's a very uh, wide encompassing sort of whiskey. It, it coats your mouth. There, there's a lot going in there. There's the slightest hint of. Uh, as, as soon as I said it, it went away. I'm going to need a little bit more of this, uh, and I can do that. Uh, and because we're in stay at home, not lockdown orders at the moment, I don't really feel guilty about if I dip into these samples a little bit uh, because there's not that many people around to share them with, unfortunately. Uh, so sorry if you're sitting at home and would normally come into the oak barrel and, and steal a sample. Um, I'll try and keep a little bit for in a couple of weeks when hopefully we can let um, more and more people back in. But I'm stealing a little bit more of this because there's – I was going to say there's a little bit of like just a hint of dark chocolate bitterness in there, but as soon as I thought it and went to say it, it disappeared. And it, it's strong. There's there's an oomph to it. There's a bit of um, you know at forty seven point five. You know I feel that weight probably a little bit more than I did in in the other ones so far. And, and funnily enough, the uh, the, uh, the the Manic Moore and the Glen Keith uh, both stand out to me in, in their prettiness. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call this whiskey. This is a bit more of a working class sort of sherry cask, which. Well, enough is, as I said, is is up my uh, is up my alley when it comes to sherry cask. So I want to see a bit of grit. I want to see a bit of oomph. Um, everyone's different. I mean, there's I, know, I can see how people who love the cleanest of clean sherry casks without a a, a foot wrong and very precise. Uh, you know, it's it's like Glamorangi La Santa. This is not type thing. This this has got a bit of guts to it. A whiskey, I'd, I'd say it's very front forward. The the back end is quite biscuity. Um, you've got a little bit more of that caramelly sort of note. Um, but I think the star of the show here is is that that nose, that oomph on the on the nose and into that front palate. Um, uh, I, I think the yeah probably again the manic and the, the Pulteney so far has probably had the best finish in terms of like interest and wanting me to go back and and that sort of thing. Let's uh, let's dig into what the the bottlers, Cunmore and Morrison's themselves say uh, about this uh, Ben Reak 2013. Uh, in terms of their quick overview, lovely dried spices, great depth of notes with cedarwood and a nutty finish. So, yeah, I mean, slightly different notes to what, what I got, but, again, they're going spices, um, you know, woody notes, nuttiness. None of those things are necessarily the what you would associate with clean sherry casts. They're, they're a little bit more grit, a little bit more oomph uh, to them. So... Uh, um, that is quite quite interesting that we went slightly different ways of appreciating the the same thing uh, in that release. Uh, so very very interesting on that one. And uh, yeah, I'll come back. To, I'm not going to come back. I'll just finish it now because there's more in that sample bottle if I need. So let's go into uh, the final whiskey of this quick little video about these new releases. <laughs> Time those uh, glasses perfectly. Got exactly night glasses. We're going to go into uh, another sherry cask, um, or should I say plural? Because again, if we're going by my imperfect science of just reading labels and trying to decipher them, we have a Kalila here or Kalila, um, depending on which part of the island you come from. Uh, 2012 vintage Oloroso sherry butts, so plural, um, and certainly with a bottle out turn of 1,365, uh, we're probably looking at. Uh, three or three or four butts here. Um, of course, remembering that as an independent bottler and as as bottle brokers, there's no need to actually put every uh, drop of a, a barrel into a release. They might have, a, you know, I'm just speaking hypothetically here. I have no idea how, the inner workings of Morrison's and, and how they work their whiskies, but they might theoretically have 10 barrels of whiskey um, and they will create a batch of 1,365 across those 10. Um, or they might pick two or three and put them together. It might be one that has a certain element that is quite overpowering or like quite dominant, and so they will almost use that as, as what I call salt and pepper blends uh, to sort of top up some of the others. But um, we're 
if, if they are straight cars, we're probably talking about three um, three or four uh, Oloroso Sherry Butts from Kalila. It's an eight-year-old, uh, famous, famous distillery. Uh, and when I was talking before about how I like my Sherry cast, a little bit of grits, a little bit of oomph to them, not necessarily the prettiest things ever. Um, I think this one's going to do the uh, the trick straight off the off the spec. So uh, I'll bring it bring it back up again. Again, the the color is is very uh, naked, and I will actually what I can do now is I scroll back through them. Uh, so that's the Ben React to the Kalila, quite similar in color. The Ben React's a little bit darker. The Glen Keith, uh, the Glen Bergie, which is probably the lightest out of the bunch. Um, the Manic Moor, uh, I, I I correct myself. The Pulteney certainly the lightest out of the bunch. Definitely refill barrels there. Um, but as I said, all, all done with the exact same lighting structure and lighting level, so you can see it, it is quite a dark whiskey. Um, yeah, it's got that, like the sweetness is a little bit muffled by the by the smoke. You, you can see heaven and hell, you know, the yin and yang of the, the sweetness and the, and the smoke sort of fighting there. But it has that Kalila freshness as well. There's a bit of citrus in there. Bit of like uh, you know, uh, lemon peel that you've left out for too long. Like last night's gin and tonics, you forgot to clean up, and the lemon peel's drying out a little bit, and that's sort of what it's starting to taste like, with smell like. Lots of cured meats, uh, smoked meats, like prosciutto and that sort of stuff as well on the nose. It's lending itself to a little bit of um, a little bit of barbecue, but I'm I'm. I, I still think uh, that that sort of smoked cured meats, um, you know, you know, meat, meats in salt rather than than big barbecue notes on this one. Uh, fitting, fittingly last, I was the only Peter uh, of of the night, so uh, was the only candidate to to go last. But certainly, uh, definitely fits that bill. The, the the nose is is quite powerful. It's got a bit of uh, you know the, the, there's a bit of that battle. It's it's a dynamic kind of nose. The the palate on the other hand is is very restrained for me. It's very soft. Um, maybe soft's the wrong word. It's very rounded. It's very easy. It's it's coating. It doesn't fight. There's certainly other whiskies we've I've tried this uh, this evening, like the Glen Keith um, and the, you know, the Pulteney that had that bit of uh, vibrancy on the palate. This is a glide. This um, really just glides straight on the palate onto onto the finish. Very, very elegant, but um, sort of chewy and thick at, at the same time. Maybe, maybe you know, like uh, if you have an, a thick shake rather than a milkshake. That sort of when you step up to that sort of level, that the thickness it sort of sticks on you. It makes your tongue feel a little bit heavier because it, it's gliding on the on the way through. Going, going back, I think that the nose improves after the second time around. This is a very – I'd say this is probably as alluring as that nose on the Glen Keith. This, this is one that wants to suck you in a little bit. I mean, it's it's sherried Kalila uh, or Kalila. Um, so you can't – you know, there's been so many examples of this where it's worked really, really well, and this is another example of it working really, really well. I'll bring uh, that, that bottle up again. This, this is one that, um, you know, is, is the biggest outturn of what we're trying tonight, 1,365 bottles. Um, having said that, still minimal to, to Australia, you know, Carnmore and, and Morrison's in general uh, building in Australia. They've spent a lot of time not here. Uh, so, you know, there's no real reason to send this stuff to Australia. You could sell this all in Europe or America, wherever you wanted to. So everything we get is a bit of a privilege and, and not a right, but... Um, but yeah, I mean everything is selling out very, very quickly. So that's that's a good sign to, to hopefully get more in the future. Uh, question coming through: How heavy is the peat in the in the Kalila? Um, not not overly. I'd, I'd say it's it's sort of Kalila. You know, in terms, it's not the the driving bright force of of some of the other ones. Like the 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 sherry cask has kept it a little bit, uh, you know, grounded that peat. The you know, by the other side, the the peat has strangled that sweetness down a little bit, and that's why that nose is initially was a bit of that battle of you know who's going to take supremacy here. You get onto the palate, and they just sort of shake hands and go, "Okay, we're in this for the long haul together." So um, definitely, the the peat is there, but I've definitely had 
um, uh, Kalilas that show, you know, more prominent peat and smoke. But you know, it's 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 certainly Kalila grade. Um, I'm not going to start quoting PPMs or anything like that, but it's certainly a peated whiskey. Um, you know, there have been uh, you know Gordon and McPhail bottlings with uh, certain Kalilas into wine casts and that sort of thing. I'm seeing a bit of similarity there. Um, probably the most prominent and widely available in this sort of 100 to 150 sort of price point is the Bamore 15, which is the Bamore 12 put into sherry cast for the for the final three years. Um, obviously, it's a lot peatier, a lot more smoke than that release. Um, but if you liked that release, I can sort of see how this would sort of sit there with you. But yeah, pl pl plenty of smoke, but certainly not overpowering and. And actually, as as you know, I'm giving this a bit of time. And as I say, don't take this with gospel because we've uh, we're spending about um, 40 minutes so far to do six whiskies. So that's less than 10 minutes per whiskey. And and I'm literally opening these as, as we do this. So I could come back here and do this tomorrow, and they're going to be a lot more expressive and show a lot more things. But um, uh, you know, I, even as I'm seeing this, I'm seeing a lot more ashy smoke, um, almost like sort of like last night's ashtray sort of element. But yeah, I think I think the smoke is winning on the on the nose, and the the sherry is winning on the palate. Um, even if there is a handshake agreement going on. Mm. Very tasty. I think um, by the time you you listen to this one, um, that Kalila will, will almost certainly be gone. It's probably the most in demand out of the, these releases. So, look, thanks for thanks for keeping me company here on a, on a very quick little. Um, uh, video tonight basically doing this live so that I don't have to do the videos individually and cut them up and then upload them into YouTube I can just take this video and put it under all the products uh, moving forward so uh, thank you everyone for, for joining thank you for the questions for everyone and um, we'll be back with some more reviews and this sort of thing moving forward because I can't go to any bars at the moment and I can't host any whiskey tastings and invite you people in while we're at stay-at-home orders so um, we have some releases coming up. There's a whole bunch of Cooper's Choice that you can't see, but I can see um, at the corner of my right eye there. It's going to be excellent, some cool stuff. We might do one tomorrow night with with those releases. Uh, and there's also the Maktala and Old Perth uh, things that went on the shelf uh, last week that we'll probably do in a, a tasting as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we will see you back at the Oak Barrel uh, very soon, hopefully, if not in person, uh, definitely over video. Cheers. <laughs>